we'll straight away go to uh, our, um, uh, our speakers um, just to give them time. Today is really very informal. It's to allow them to just uh, interact with us, introduce themselves, uh, maybe give us a snippet peek of what is, uh, what is expected next week. I'll give them one or two minutes just to, to do that uh, for us. We'll start, um, I'll just follow the list that I have. I'll start with you, my brother, Doug. <laughs> Some movement there. <laughs> Since you're already on the line, or since you're already on, I'll start with yourself. Yeah, I sensed it. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, greetings in the name that is above every other name, the name to which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. It's really nice to, to be here, and I would like to thank the organizers for having given us uh, the opportunity to participate in this wonderful conference. And Mr. President, thank you so much for those exciting ways. You know, you made me feel proud to be an African, even as you were, as, as you were just talking and uh, elaborating on the vision. Basically, my name is Doug Mamvura. Uh, I'm sure if, if you have gone through the, um, the, the pamphlets, you've seen the, the, um, my, my profile there, so I don't really have to say much, uh, apart from the fact that uh, I'm, I'm a marketplace apostle. My desire really is to transform lives and organizations. Um, that, is, that is something that wakes me up every morning. I really enjoy seeing lives being transformed. And I believe like the president was saying, this is the time for us as Africans. There's no need for us to keep looking back. You know, you, you, you don't, you, no matter what has happened in your past, your future still remains spotless. Our future still remains spotless regardless of whatever we've gone through even as a continent here in Africa. So this is really our time. And um, we are so excited uh, to be alive during, uh, during the time such as this. So basically in terms of uh, my, my, my topic, uh, I've been really requested to talk about innovation and entrepreneurship to fuel Africa's growth. You know, what I'm just going to be trying to cover is um, just focusing on uh, the fact that, you know, Africa has always been considered to be a Dutch nation, and, uh, and as a result of that, some of us, sadly, even as Africans, we have seen ourselves casting our own continent, you know. Now, instead of casting the, the duck, the idea is to light the candle. And I believe even as I will be sharing with us, um, tomorrow, I guess, um, I'll try and really help us to, to see how we can really um, light this candle because we can do it. We can do it because the power that rose Christ from the dead is resident within us. So there's nothing that is really impossible to those who believe. So we are, we, 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 we are dynamite and we are able to do that. So for me, I see Africa as an island of opportunities in a sea of challenges. And those are the challenges that are gonna help us to really um, come up with effective strategies that will transform our, our continent. Because the population of Africa right now, you are looking at almost like 1.3 billion. And uh, I was looking at, uh, at an article where they were saying, the World Bank was saying that by year 2030, 87% uh, of our population is, is, going, is uh, projected to be poor by 2030. And uh, we reject that in the name of Jesus. This is why we have a conference like this to really transform lives here. Do you know here in Africa, the richest people here, you're looking at 0.001%, uh, they own 40% of the wealth in Africa. And so, and yet we have over 400 uh, million of the 1.3 billion who are actually considered to be poor. And uh, the idea now is to really transform these lives. And uh, the, one of the engines that we are gonna use to transform these lives will be um, entrepreneurship and innovation. That, that, that is very critical um, for, for that transformation to really take place. And that there are so many opportunities for us. And um, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs are actually supposed to be change agents. And I believe that uh, as, as I try to share with us tomorrow, we're gonna see how as entrepreneurs, we, we, are able, we should be able to really transform uh, this lovely continent that God has blessed us with, so many resources uh, that we have, and it's just incredible. And I would like to also share with us 
on how the so-called bottom of the pyramid, those are the people who are earning uh, maybe less than $2 uh, a day, we can have less than $2 a day, how we can actually use uh, that segment to transform our continent. Um, so basically, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me end here, you know, the challenge is that I'm both a marketer and, uh, and, uh, and a preacher. So I've got the gift of continuity. So I will end at this stage, lest I take so much time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mamvua. We look forward to your session tomorrow. Uh, thank you for those very um, good, a good start. We're already excited about tomorrow. I'll go to Solomon who's kicking us off uh, tomorrow. Uh, Solomon, welcome. Uh, if you can just introduce yourself and um, give us a sneak peek of um, what you're doing tomorrow. Thank you so much. Um, and we thank God for another iteration of um, Inspire Africa, uh, two of the most um, impactful um, conferences I've had in my life are uh, the two times that one has had the opportunity to be in um, Uganda for two previous um, conferences really been key in one's um, journey. Well, by way of introduction, I think um, I may not need to introduce myself too much because uh, Mr. Uh, Paul Wafula has uh, said that uh, it is my generation and uh, I'm, I'm surprised that uh, the Lord paid for that IP because he says the Solomon's generation. So, so that it's, it's my generation and that, that's by way of, um, of a joke. I think that this is also very key to my own personal mission. When I was led to craft the mission of my life as being to integrate Africa into the mainstream of global significance and reckoning, I didn't quite understand okay, the ramifications that this could go. And I see that this is a part for, of it because uh, the subject I'm also supposed to be talking about is divine order in creativity and design. And that happens to be what I do. Um, I was an advertising creative director and then I moved on to the whole area of um, creative um, strategy to design marketing communication for products and um, services in the Africa and in the wider um, Europe, Middle East and Africa markets. So my talk is essentially going to take off from the purposeful definition of the terms creativity, design and innovation fit for the whole concept of kingdom. That is the distinctions of these definitions, how it relates to kingdom. And then, as relating to the kingdom, the kingdom agenda, I'm going to be looking at Africa's peculiar opportunities for creativity, okay? What the opportunity sources are for Africa to actually create from the understanding of creativity as we, as we have, separate from the usual understanding of light bulbs and then um, colors and all of that, to be in the disciplined effort to improve and change potential. It's about actually improving and changing potential. And then we are going to be talking about exponential growth and stuff like that when we talk about uh, innovation as introducing new meanings so that you create, radi you, you get radical new value. And I'm going to be speaking on design, being central to discipling nations from the understanding of the definition of design across all verticals. We are going to be looking at verticals and we are going to be looking at a design being um, a horizontal from the point of view of what some people have crafted as capability centers, some have crafted them as mountains, whether media, whether medicine, whether justice, whether finance, and all of that. And how you use this in discipline nations and how design is central to, 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 to all of this. We're actually also going to be talking about the need to introduce design learning and knowledge as a vertical to be taught in church, being the source pipe or the pipeline from which kingdom agenda 
is given to each and every Christian. So no, no design, no creativity, and no creativity, no innovation. So we are going to be talking about how this is actually a call to a new civilization for man and enterprise to perform at their most advanced. It's, 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 it's that serious as being the words that Isaiah saw and the reason why it is recommended that the world that is failing and that is in a crisis will say that let us go to the house of the God of Jacob so he will teach us his ways. What are we supposed to do? How have people been able to weaponize? How has fallen man been able to weaponize uh, business, production, productivity, and all the consequences that we are seeing today? And then the redemptive impact of Christians as people in this, I mean, in, in kingdom to bring God's kingdom to come to pass. And then we are going to be ending with a, a thesis by which I think that we should provoke ourselves to understand that no design, there is no innovation and no innovation, you won't go to heaven. Because we are going to be proposing the whole idea that if what you make or produce, if the output of your business is essentially demeaning and ruining life, how is it possible for that person or that business or for the person who's practicing those actions to go to heaven? So that's the challenge that we are going to be looking at and giving to ourselves. So it's essentially the redemptive impact of design and innovation in discipling um, nations. So that's um, what one would say are the highlights of what, we are, of what we are going to be discussing. And then the structure, because we need to design a structure it, in itself to be able to lead us to this, because it's possible that the structure as we have now is too much of what I want to call a cathedral structure and how we can get a, a learning structure, a campus structure to be able to understand and use Christianity and practice it to the goal of kingdom. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Solomon. I think that's wonderful. I'm just, I think just warning us that we must come ready to take serious notes. Um, some very deep stuff coming from Solomon. I don't see the, uh, our speakers for day two. That's um, I, Ivy and, um, and, and Professor Anand. I'm sure and, uh, uh, Professor Anand is not able to join us because of maybe the time difference. He will join us from, from, from India, as well as uh, Ivy joining us from, uh, uh, from, from Ghana. We'll go to day three, and I will ask um, um, uh, Pastor Levan Jumba to um, uh, introduce uh, introduce himself and just give us a, a glimpse of what you'll be sharing. Uh, I'm very excited about this day, Pastor Levin. Yes, sir. Uh, praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, greetings in Jesus' name. Um, Laban Jumba, I came to know the Lord many years back. I was 15 years of age. I saw Uganda getting independent. I was 12 years of age. So you are talking of an old guy. I don't know if we should talk of the David generation of the fighters uh, who are phasing out. But uh, what I'm going to share has a lot to do with what I've gone through the last more than 70 years now. Um, I have engaged in both preaching the gospel as an evangelist and a teacher of the word, and also prayer. I was engaged in praying during the time of Idi Amin in Uganda. When he took over the nation, I was uh, in my first year at the university. And so all those years I've seen what has been going on and we've been engaged in prayer. And we have not seen the transformation we've been praying for. Until the Lord began to speak to me through Isaiah chapter, 58, that is our chapter's intercessors, praying with fasting. And it says in that chapter that when we pray right, verse 12 of chapter 58, those from among you shall build the old ruins. I said, oh, I thought I'm an intercessor in the closet. Now the Lord is saying we are the ones to build the ruins. Then as a preacher, 
following the Messiah in Isaiah 61, the people of the Messiah in verse 4, it says, they shall build the old ruins. And that was the turning point in my life, that it is not the politicians and it's not the economists. It's not all those people we look at. It is with people of the Messiah who are to transform the nation. So after pastoring for many years and engaging in all Christian ministry, I am now in a new type of pastoral ministry, establishing a Christian village on almost a hundred acres of land deep in the African countryside. We are building modern residential homes deep in the village, complete with running water, flashing toilets, solar power, powerful enough to operate lighting and medium level gadgets like fridges, TVs, computer, mixers, blenders, and other medium powered domestic you know, gadgets. This is deep in the village. We are establishing an agriculture farm together with agro-processing and value addition. We are also planning to build cottage industries and small factories engaging in non-farming activities like making furniture, shoes, handbags, etc. We'll build a skills training institute in the village or farm. When properly established, we want to provide the employment to hundreds of people, both the members of our Christian village and the people from the surrounding villages. You might be wondering, what is this preacher talking about? We shall be inviting families to join our Christian village community. Each family is encouraged to buy an acre of land on the farm and construct their own home and establish family enterprises. Members with the professional skills will work in our hospital, medical center, all of these are on the farm. Others will teach in our primary and secondary schools. Others will lecture at our college level skills training institute. And our members will have many jobs in the community as agronomists, agronomists accountants, skilled managers, ICT professionals, secretaries, marketers, trainers, builders, etc. We are growing our own food and there is no hungry person in our village. We have established two such villages so far in Uganda. They're in the beginning stages, but they're getting established. One in Guru in northern Uganda, and the second one near Mubende in the Midwest. We plan to establish thousands of such Christian villages all around the country in the next few years, engaging and employing millions of people. They will become the new face of the church in Africa instead of mere congregations. You see, this is the transition. We have thought of the church as a congregation. But I am beginning to see if we are to transform Africa. We're talking about the reset, the reset. Jesus wants to transform his church from being mere congregations to being complete communities like these villages which were establishing in the countryside. I got the inspiration to build this model of the church from Abraham of the Bible. He fathered and pastored the community of 318 families. That is Genesis 14, 14, 318 families. The Bible tells us about his 318 trained servants who were born or adopted into his household. This means they were his spiritual sons and not mere servants. He trained them in the military tactics to defend uh, their livestock farming, uh, sorry. He also, he trained them in military tactics to defend their community, but he also trained them in agriculture and livestock farming to care for their family flocks and to grow food to feed their large household. You, you have that scripture in mind if you don't know it, Genesis 14, 14. There was no jobless or redundant person in their community. Neither was there any needed person among them. So when we look at joblessness on the African continent, and God is saying it is people from among you who build the old ruins, who set up foundation for future generations. God began to speak to me through Abraham. Let me conclude by just telling you a little bit about Abraham and then we'll leave the rest of it for the week. Abraham taught and mentored those 318 families spiritually. And we clearly see this in his chief servant, Eliezer, 
whom he got from Damascus in Syria to see his spirit, to be his spiritual. When you look at him, you see his spiritual quality and stature. Whom we read about, he were not merely workers employed by Abraham. He was planning, he was planning to hand over the family estate to Eliezer as his heir, you remember. He regarded Eliezer as a true son who could inherit his estate and care for the rest of the community after Abraham died. The Lord spoke to me through meditating on these scriptures that these Abraham type communities were his original dream and vision for the Christian church. I believe this period of the pandemic and the global economic reset, which the globalists are planning, God wants to transform his church to the original plan, which was his original dream and vision for the church. In Abraham, God had a dream of covering the whole earth with such God-fearing, God-knowing communities. That was why God said, through him and his seed, the whole world, would be blessed. So these are the Abraham type communities that we, we are establishing. These Abraham like Christian communities will become building blocks for the future socioeconomic structure of Africa. You see, I'm not an economist, but when God began to speak to me through this, I said, wow, I wish I had got this earlier. It is the Christian church according to Isaiah 58 and Isaiah 61 that will build the old west places establishing new foundations for many future generations, repairing the broken walls and restore righteous paths and suitable dwelling places. This is the key to Africa's restoration. 500 years ago, there was the Industrial Revolution. It moved the people from their inheritance on the land, in the villages, into towns. Everybody educated in Uganda lives within 50 kilometers of Kampala. Now, through this reset of the church, if I can call it a reset, God wants to move things back to reverse the movement of the Industrial Revolution, where we get capable people going back to the inheritance on the land and transforming it from there and making it very modern. God bless you. We'll discuss much more uh, during the course of the week. God bless you. Thank you, thank you, Pastor Levin. Um, I just love the practicality that uh, you bring to um, what you're proposing. We're really looking forward to uh, to Wednesday when you share with us more. Uh, we didn't want you to stop, but time is not on our side. Thank you very much for that. It reminds me of the kibbutz. Um, I think ten years ago, I visited Israel and went to the to the kibbutz uh, in, in in Israel. So it reminds me so much of that. Uh, Dr. Magara said would be joining us a little later. Um, you've commented on the kibbutz. Yes. You've commented, you've commented on the kibbutz. Do you realize kibbutz played a big role in the establishment of Israel? Yeah. This type of community similar to kibbutz is going to play a big role in the transformation of Africa. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very, very much. Um, guys, Wednesday is not to be missed. Um, if you're planning to miss, it's, you can't miss this, um, these insights. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I see Dr. James has joined us. Um, Dr. James, um, you're welcome. If you can just introduce yourself briefly and then give us a, a, a quick snip in what you'll be discussing on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Um, on the road, so oh, you're not going to get a very good view of me. Um, but um, on, I'm talking about Africa preparing to take off. And uh, what I want to do is basically give a picture of the journey that nations take as they grow uh, from uh, immature nations to mature nations. Um, the, I'll paint that picture and then also share. Uh, some of the thoughts that I have with regard to issues like uh, security on the continent, which is really the foundation for any kind of growth. The information that I share will uh, be important for one, to give a big vision, a bigger vision of what we need to be, one, the point of prayer praying for, but also actively involved in, uh, in doing. 
uh, as we uh, as we look at the growth and the content of the So look at uh, things like education, infrastructure, uh, the use of farming. Are we taking a wide swap around that? So my presentation is going to be more, more on the, uh, I call it uh, the practical things that need to be done, uh, some of which are being done already, but also things that will need to be done. I think that's all I'll say for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Magara, and uh, thanks for even allowing to speak to us while you're on the move. Uh, that is very much appreciated and we look forward to uh, the work that you've done the blueprints that you have um, that can help us transition from where we are to where we want to be as africa we're looking forward to wednesday let's move to thursday uh, and i will invite um, dr carlton uh, williams uh, to just um, introduce himself and give us a, a sneak peek of thursday uh, Dr. Carlton? Um, you know, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm very excited um, to be on the panel of speakers, um, but I'm also excited to be a participant. I mean, it's great to hear uh, from uh, the previous speakers, and I'm, I'm really excited about joining those sessions and learning from them as well. Um, I'm Carlton Williams. Uh, I'm based in Lagos, and um, You've probably read my profile. Um, I am a pastor. Um, we have a ministry that's raising leaders um, in Nigeria uh, called High Life um, uh, to serve the nation. Um, and also I do a couple of other things. Um, Niara, which is a Swahili word for one with high purpose, is a, is a transformational change vehicle. Also looking at raising leaders and providing solutions through inspired innovation. You know, we can't um, solve problems on the same level of thinking that produced them. Uh, we need inspired innovation. I believe that's a quote from, from Einstein. Um, I've been asked to speak about collaboration for success. Um, we are better together and looking specifically at why it is critical uh, for Africans, especially the Ecclesia, uh, to collaborate in advancing the kingdom mandate. Um, uh, what I plan to do is just share a little bit about the Ecclesia. Um, but you know, like Paul uh, Wafulu said earlier on, um, quoting from Isaiah 43, uh, he says, I do a new thing, uh, and it's important that we perceive it. You know, collaboration in business is not something new. Uh, we know that uh, together everyone achieves more. Um, but, you know, God said, I'm doing a new thing. And when he says a new thing, he's not just, he's not saying he's doing a recondition thing or improving on what we did in the past. It's, it's totally new. In fact, in Isaiah 42, 16, he says, I'm going to lead you down an unfamiliar path. So we're entering a dimension now where um, new wine will be poured in new wine skins. OK, so when we think about collaboration, um, what is the new thing that the Lord is is trying to teach us? Um, what is the new thing that is different from um, what is already prevailing, that according to Isaiah 2.2, uh, the world is going to come to us for education. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, the current prevailing philosophy um, that governs uh, collaboration for success. Um, we're going to look at how that works at the moment. And bear in mind that we're not trying to uh, replicate the West and the East. So the question we're going to be asking is, if we are to build institutions in Africa that are generational institutions, that build commonwealth, um, that breathe life instead of death, what is the kingdom philosophy 
that needs to govern our approach uh, in the area of collaboration. Yeah, what is the kingdom philosophy? Uh, and that's what we're going to be examining um, um, in this particular session. Um, and uh, to give you a hint, I'm going to be focusing on our why. Uh, you know, normally in business, um, you think about what you want to do and you think about um, how you're going to get it done. Uh, and, and you, know, in, you know, in business school, you learn that it's not just about how you're going to get it done. Uh, the next thing you need to think about is who you're going to get it done with. Um, but then we need to interrogate our why. And I believe that the, the why we're in business, the why we want to see change um, is going to be a, an important driver in our approach to collaboration and the critical nature of it in bringing to pass what we would like to see. Um, I'm looking forward to the session and um, I believe that, you know, for there to be a real shift uh, in, our, in, our, in, in the fruit of our lives and the fruit of our businesses, there also needs to be a shift in our philosophy. So it's that philosophy of kingdom collaboration that I will be examining. So I'll stop there uh, for now. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Carlton. <clears throat> we look forward to Thursday. Um, um, I always tell Dr. Carlton that he's one of my greatest teachers. He actually pastored me when I was in Lagos. So I have a real connection um, with the insights that you provide. Welcome and thank you. Thank you for that. I'll go to Dr. Eunice uh, at Bango to just um, uh, introduce yourself and give us uh, your view. Um, good evening, everyone, or good, good whatever, <laughs> depending on where you are. I'm very delighted to be on the call this evening. It's raining heavily in my part of the country, but I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to be online. Um, on Thursday, a bit different from what uh, Dr. Carlton is going to share. He's going to talk about the how, the why. I'm going to share about the how, and I'm going to give the practicality of how we can collaborate and what that can do. Um, most of you who listen to me speaking usually ask me why I give a lot of personal examples and why I always have a lot of um, practicalities of what I teach. And the truth is though I'm trained as a civil engineer and I, I, I thought all my life that actually I was just going to be at the university and teach and become a professor and you know just keep on teaching and teaching. About um, 13 years ago, God cast me into the business space and the mandate for me was so that I can learn. And then through the wisdom that I have, I'll be able to teach others. So I'm one of those like in 2 Corinthians uh, 1, 3, where the Bible says that, you know, God comforts you in your troubles such that with the same comfort that he gives you, you comfort others. I'm one of those who have done business and I've got my fingers burnt. I've got, I've, I've put in a lot of money. I have done about uh, 13 businesses, but 12 of them just didn't turn out right. But all that was training. I was learning. I was learning how I can do this and how I can win at it. So eight years ago, I started one that uh, most people know me for. Uh, Uni's Kitchen. I started it eight years ago and then I just started to apply biblical principles. I remember I started to go for the, uh, the intercessors for Africa conferences, met people like uh, Pastor Laban Jumba, met Barista Emek and you know everything that they were teaching, I kept on trying to apply it and then it started to just work so fine. And then the burden came um, you know, God started to tell me, I want you to be able using those same principles to train and teach others. So I started to coach. I started to teach. Now, while I was on that path, he gave me another burden. He said, there is so many people who can work in Africa to transform Africa, but they are not able to do it personally, they need someone else who is investing to be able to do this with them. During that time, I had a quote from someone that really got me. The person said, it's better to be, be, to be small in a big thing than to be big 
in a small thing. And then I realized Uni's Kitchen was working so well. How about if I invite other people? Just like God, he said, come, let us make man in our own image. He invited. I mean, even in, in Isaiah, he says, come, let's reason together. And then in Ecclesiastes, he tells us, Two are better than one, for they have a better return for their work. A cord of three strands, you know, is stronger. And so I tried it out and I said, okay, um, both I and my husband at first were thinking, will people trust us? How are they going to feel? How about if people think we are going to cheat them or anything? But then we realized, no, we are standing on the backbone of our own integrity and the things that God has taught us. And so we invited people to join us last year. Uh, actually, one of the people that joined us is uh, the chair for Inspire Africa, and it was very interesting because he had never met us in person, but somehow the spirit of God was able to, you know, um, give him and the wife comfort that we were the right people, and we have been walking this journey so beautifully together, and we, we continue inviting more people to join us, and there is just so many ideas in the pipeline. I have quite a number of people on this call that I have coached and some of them, even as I mentor them and keep following them up, the issue for them is who can I do this with so that it's not a small thing because sometimes for entrepreneurs, you have very little to put in and yet the vision is so big. And yet if you were so many together, you would be able to do this and accelerate it. So that is my burden. And that is what I'm going to be teaching during this conference. And I will give practicals I will share from my experiences, the good, the bad, the funny, the things that will make you cry, and I just can't wait to share with you. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Eunice. Uh, very exciting stuff uh, that you're doing. We look forward to Thursday uh, sharing the how. Um, we're really uh, excited about that. Let's just move then to a panelist of doctors that we've assembled. Um, we all know that uh, during this season, there's quite a lot of people who are uh, having mental health issues and all sorts of health. So we've, we've, uh, we've um, uh, come up with a panel of very, very influential doctors in the marketplace who will be talking to us. I will just ask, uh, maybe we'll start with Lukundo, if you can introduce yourself briefly. Dr. Rukundo. Yeah, thank you, Emma, for, for this opportunity. And I thank you all members for, for this meeting. Um, I'm Godfrey Zari Rukundo. I'm a psychiatrist and a senior lecturer at Mbarara University of Science and Technology, where I have been for about 20 years now. And uh, I'll be talking about investment in health. And um, I'll be looking at a number, of, a number of areas, but one of the things I'll be focusing on is uh, the fact that investment in health starts with uh, the individual in himself, looking at their self-care, looking at their self-esteem, and um, no, looking at what they, themselves they can do. Instead of having that dependency syndrome where we usually look at other people doing everything for us. Um, because poor health can be costly to the individual, to the family, but also to, to the society or the country. And yet investment in, the, in health can indeed be an economic imperative um, for whoever is, uh, is involved. Recently, uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen so many people coming back from, um, from the Arab world especially, with so many uh, mental health issues. And they went there for, for, for economic benefits, but they have come back with so many mental health issues. Because I think as a country, we looked at exporting cheap labor without considering how they would cope in such a situation and without knowing how they would be impacted by working in a new environment for which um, they were not, they were not uh, prepared for. But I was looking at, uh, as Africans, we are, we are so dependent on the outside world without looking at what we have as Africa. And yet in Africa, we have all that is necessary for us to be able to, to have good health because our forefathers had better health that we have now. 
But looking at what is going on currently in Africa, um, we are copying and and pasting what we get from from the from the from the other economies. What may not be working here, but we want to bring the the behaviors. We want to bring the feeding. We want to bring um, there are many things in the, in the developed world to use them in Africa, and yet they cannot work here. So we need to be able to look at our own potentials because we have potential as, in, as Africans. And we have seen it during this COVID pandemic that we have seen people, Africans, including Ugandans here, developing apps that were useful for health, they are making hand sanitizers, which we used to import, making medications, which have just come up in a few, in a few months that we have been exposed to COVID-19 where there were travel restrictions to go abroad. So I want to encourage Africans to look at the potential that we have and change our mentality of depending on the outside world because we have the potential, the potential here. And they also want to encourage the church to take its place, to be advocates for health and also to enhance the capacity of their members and also uh, help them to change their attitudes towards their own health, towards their own country or their own continent, and also towards their own investment in their own health. So that's what I'll be focusing on because when we do that, our health will be better and basically uh, our mental health will be, will be much better. Personally, I have been exposed to different countries, but I have chosen to stay in Uganda to serve my country and um, I focused on training other psychiatrists and other um, health workers, and I keep encouraging them to work in Uganda. And I am proud to have many products in the areas where we never used to have psychiatrists. Now we have uh, psychiatrists, and we are continuing to do that to make sure that we don't have to, to, to depend on the outside world. So that's what I'll be talking about mainly, um, trying to encourage us to invest in our own health. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Rukundo. Uh, let's hear from Dr. Ruth. Hello. Welcome, Dr. Ruth. Thank you very much. Let me put on the light. Oops. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be here this evening. Um, I've been requested and I want to thank the organizers and the president, Emma, thank you. Um, my topic under investment in health, our greatest wealth is mental health and psychosocial support. Let me first introduce myself so that you know where my passion is. Um, I'm a counseling psychologist, my master's and my PhD are in counseling. And I'm thankful to God that I'm one of the first counselors, if not the first professional counselors in Uganda. I'm also the founding president of Uganda Counseling Association. So now you know, for 29 years, I have been counseling. I've been working as a therapist. Some people call it therapist. Some people call it counseling but that's what I've been doing. And um, I do some training also. So I've trained many counselors, especially um, in Makere University. I have briefly taught in Deje University, and now I'm part-timing with Uganda Christian University in counseling. So I am dishing out African counselors. And for me, that is, one of the greatest gifts that God has given me. So when you think about the topic, well, the other things that I am, um, I'm also a, a president of Mother's Union. So the, the president of Inspire, I want to join you to say that I'm also your, your excellency. So <laughs> I am a, a president of Mother's Union in my country, Uganda, and I take... Um, control of 37 dioceses in the Church of Uganda. I'm also a canon 
have been given that title, responsibility in the Church of Uganda, and I thank God for it. I've been married for 36 years. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. So I thank God for all those things because all those things have contributed a lot to the counseling profession that I do. Right now, I am a, I'm in private practice. I've just retired from Bank of Uganda where I worked for 22 years in uh, uh, heading the counseling for those 1,000 um, staff that I was leading that, that were in Bank of Uganda. And I thank God for the opportunity that he gave me. I'm a Christian. I love the Lord. I accepted the Lord very many years ago, over 40 years ago. I have walked with the Lord and he has guided me in everything that I do. So when they gave me this topic, mental health and psychosocial support, I am going to do great justice to it. Explain what mental health is. Explain particularly what psychosocial support is. And what are we doing in Africa? And how are we handling mental health? What are some of the things that are, are, are making us fail, are making us go backwards in, in all? I thank God for the topics that are coming before. And uh, uh, when I listened to the president who was talking about resetting and restoration in Africa, and that's part of my passion. Whenever I've been teaching counselors, I'm saying we need to be able to get very far in Africa. We need to invest a lot in what we are doing. So psychosocial support in Africa and making it a priority is one of the things that I'm going to talk about. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ruth. We look forward to you doing justice. I will, will, will hold you to your word and uh, we are sure you'll do justice. We are really expectant for uh, that hyper-packed session. We'll move to uh, um, yeah, Professor Nan. We recognize you. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, we we recognize your your presence. We'll move to um, uh, our Friday, which is um, economics and finance. Um, Apostle Moses is not here. Neither is Joy um, from from Kenya. I think they are all traveling. But we have uh, Patrick Kuana who will be talking about um, uh, social enterprises, uh, the kingdom economics. Uh, Patrick, I'll give you a chance to just introduce yourself and share a little bit what you'll be sharing on Friday. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Um, it's always such a pleasure to be part of this uh, conference. So thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, yeah, just so inspired already, just hearing all the topics and uh, all the wisdom that uh, the other speakers have been sharing. So yeah, really excited uh, for this uh, for this week. Um, from my side, uh, as you have introduced, my name is Patrick uh, Kuwana, and I am Zimbabwean, but based in Johannesburg in South Africa, and I run a um, venture capital, um, private equity uh, business. And um, the topic that I'll be talking about is driving uh, kingdom economics with a special uh, view on the social entrepreneurship side of things. And I think just to give a little bit of a background, you know, part of my journey in, in pursuing um, this, you know, really results out of many years of wrestling with the issue around why we as Africa have been blessed with such an abundance of resource, um, and yet we continue to be the begging bowl of the world, and how we have been blessed more than all other continents when it comes to natural resources, people, et cetera, but somehow we have not managed to convert that into sustainable uh, wealth creation and flourishing um, on the continent. So that's really where a little bit of my background comes from and the wrestle that I've had with God on that issue. But one of the things I want to outline during the um, session on Friday is just to look at some of the foundational issues of economics so that we can all come on the same page. I believe what Africa has unfortunately um, experienced um, 
across many centuries is what I call the form of exploitative and extractive economics, um, exploitative, extractive capitalism. Unfortunately, we've been at the receiving end of that as, as a continent. And sadly, a lot of the things that we get taught in, in, in a lot of our universities, our MBAs, et cetera, whether it's top universities overseas, et cetera, they have become experts in terms of teaching the methods of extractive and exploitative economics. I believe over time, we've started to see a lot more of what I call ethical economics coming into play. We are starting to see a bit more of impact economics coming into play, but I really believe that what the Bible shows us is a form of economics that I call redemptive economics. And that's really where kingdom economics comes in. And it's all about how do we restore things to God's original design? Because when we are talking about redemptive, when we're talking about Africa and where Africa needs to go, how do we restore Africa to God's original design? And economics plays a big part in terms of doing that because economics is that very mechanism that brings about um, human flourishing within a continent. Because again, if we look at the very definition of economics, it comes out of the word, uh, the Greek word oikonomia. And what oikonomia is really talking about, it's about management of the household. So how do we get back to managing God's household? Africa is a household and therefore God wants his people to flourish within his household, within the garden. That's why Adam was given, Adam and Eve were given the task to tend to the garden. It was an economic mandate over the garden. And therefore that economic mandate continues all the way from Genesis until Revelation. So we wanna unpack a little bit of that so we understand that. But we also want to look at some of the key components of an economy in terms of resources, because there's a stewardship of resources that comes into economics. There's policies, structures, institutions that need to be put in place. But what I'm probably then going to focus on a bit more is then the issue of building the human capacity, because that's where part of the social entrepreneurship comes in. It's more about how do we build the human potential that we have so that we can properly steward the resources that we have and bring those to multiplication and bring those to fruitfulness. Um, so the social element, it's gonna be talking a, a bit more about God's divine design for us as Africans and how do we restore that, but also God's divine uh, potential for us as a continent. So when you talk about social things like education, even the, and the other panelists who talked about health, um, you know, food, et cetera, all of those things are supposed to be social entrepreneurship or social activities that are building our people so that they are fully back into their divine design so that they can achieve their full divine potential so that we can now steward the abundant resources that we've been given as a people and bring that to multiplication so that the continent can achieve its full divine potential. So that's really what I'm going to be touching on. So, and then also just the meeting point between, so where does social entrepreneurship touch into business entrepreneurship? Because these two things are supposed to feed each other because ultimately what we are trying to get to is the objective of collective and inclusive human flourishing, wealth creation, and prosperity on the continent. So those are some of the things that I will touch about um, as, we, as, we, as we talk on, on Friday. So thank you, Emmanuel. Looking forward to, to, to the conference. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, we're all excited and looking forward. Uh, I'll just move back to uh, day one, uh, sorry, day two. Uh, Professor Anand just came out of a meeting and would like to introduce himself so that we can allow him to go back. Uh, uh, Prof, you're welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for sacrificing your other meeting for us. We appreciate you, you're welcome. Thank you, Emmanuel. 
um, I'll just take a few minutes to share uh, about myself. Uh, uh, I'm glad and I'm privileged. I uh, uh, want to thank the organizers for inviting me for the third time uh, for uh, Inspire. Uh, my background, uh, as you would have seen in the profile, I have now this year, uh, the 40th year of my corporate experience. Uh, I come from, uh, with my basic degree in computer science and my master's in marketing and strategy. Uh, and I work for uh, uh, Fortune 500 companies uh, in uh, India, in Singapore, in US, in Canada, and uh, uh, UK. Uh, but largely, I've traveled a, a large number of countries. My contribution to this particular conference will come from uh, my experience and exposure uh, to uh, the global economy, uh, largely in my capacity as a member of the World Economic Forum. What is very interesting is World Economic Forum uh, is looking at uh, five capitals in the world, uh, which is very, uh, very interesting. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may be hearing it for the first time. Uh, so let me give you the good news. Uh, what will Africa be? Uh, Africa, according to World Economic Forum, by the year 2030 uh, to 2050, Africa will be the food bowl or the food capital of the world. But having said that, uh, there is a lot of contention. This is because of the natural resources that you have and because of the tremendous uh, kind of agricultural economy that is there. And I think you should leverage uh, that. But having said that, the manufacturing capital of the world uh, will be China. And uh, that is where uh, a, large of, uh, a large amount of focus is uh, there. And quite interestingly, India uh, is being seen as the intellectual capital of the world, uh, or at least going in that uh, direction. And if you see, uh, be it the software companies, uh, be it uh, the uh, education industry in US, uh, nine of the top 20 universities have got people of Indian origin uh, in, um, in key positions in all these top universities. So that is the third uh, capital uh, that uh, is going to be there. Then the two others which are on contention uh, is the whole issue on uh, what about the defense capital. Uh, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, America is uh, taking that uh, position and the finance capital uh, will possibly be uh, anywhere between Singapore and uh, Hong Kong. But those two are on contention, but food capital, manufacturing uh, uh, capital, and of course the intellectual capital is there. But having said that, what am I going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about, or the topic that is given to me is harnessing the emerging skills. So I will be briefly introducing the 10 top emerging skills that uh, World Economic Forum has said, which will be relevant in the year 2025 uh, onwards. And the challenge that is there uh, is that we have to train our people uh, uh, to equip skills and do the jobs that don't even exist today. And the COVID uh, situation has basically fast-tracked uh, this 2025 skills into possibly even 2024. The entire digital economy, uh, the entire uh, uh, ability to do uh, uh, whatever you can in a fast track, work from home, learn from home, shop from home, uh, interact from home, and uh, uh, basically collaborate from home and so on. Uh, so that is a uh, thing. So we will be talking about how to create an employee-centric learning organization. So when you want to harness skills, you have to create a learning organization according to Peter Singer's fifth discipline. Uh, so how do you create an employee-centric learning organization? Whether it be a church, whether it be a, uh, an institution, whether it be a corporate entity, or it be a country. I have done uh, these kind of workshops for 
government of Singapore. I've done this for large corporations like Cisco, Coca-Cola, uh, IBM, Deloitte, uh, um, uh, or Indian transnationals like uh, Tata's and TCA, uh, uh, HCL and uh, Accenture and so on. Uh, so I will be introducing the concept of creating an employee-centric uh, learning organization to harness the emerging skills uh, that will be there. I will talk about the top 10 emerging skills that World Economic Forum has uh, said will be relevant and how Africa uh, can, in addition to being the food bowl or the food capital of the world, can also uh, have uh, a, a share in the pie of being the intellectual capital. And the reason for this is uh, something that is in favor of Africa, which is not even uh, in favor of the European countries or the American countries or even Japan or for that matter, China. And that is the age demography. Uh, quite interestingly, Africa and India share the same age demography. And what is that age demography? Uh, the age uh, demography is that over 65% of the population are under the age of 35. So it's a young economy. Uh, we uh, see exactly the opposite in uh, Europe. We see exactly the opposite, uh, or it is skewed worse in Japan <coughs> and in US and in China, where they have an aging economy. Uh, and China largely because of the one-child policy. So they will rule the roast uh, for about, uh, let us say, uh, another 10 years. Uh, so this whole issue of diversity, uh, racial discrimination, and how well you accept people from other cultures. Uh, so pretty soon, what we are seeing today, uh, we are seeing Indians in very, very key positions in Google, in Apple, in IBM, uh, in um, Intel and uh, in uh, many, many on Microsoft and many of those organizations, if you do it well, uh, we will see a lot of Africans uh, in uh, a lot of key positions if you harness the skills that are necessary. And we have done this in a smaller size uh, for organizations like uh, Prudential, uh, like Aon, uh, like Hewitt, uh, Accenture and so on, but I want to talk about this in a larger conference and excite the people in all of Africa, not just East Africa, in all of Africa to take advantage of the platform that is available. And uh, one of the things that I really like about uh, these future predictions, uh, if you look back uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, Africa has missed out a lot of the revolutions, the industrial revolution one or two or three, but you don't have to worry uh, because we can leapfrog into uh, the latest uh, with by leveraging or by harnessing the skills. And that is uh, what I want to talk about. I do want to thank uh, all the organizers and the leaders for the platform that is given to me. And I look forward to the 10th uh, Misha. Thank you once again, Emmanuel, uh, Paul, and the entire leadership team. Thank you, Prof, and thank you for making time for us. Um, this topic is one that excites me. I think it's uh, one area as Africa that we need to really, really advance. Um, the work I do is actually in my organization is to, to create this cohort of uh, skills. Uh, so thank you very much. We look forward to the 10th uh, will be very exciting to to hear. And with your permission, I will leave because I need to go for the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We go to our last day. We are coming to to a close. Um, let's go to the day of uh, Saturday. I will start with um, Dr. Ashai, who will be giving us the strategy. Dr. Uh, uh, Reverend Ashai, if you can introduce yourself and um, just give us a, a brief of what you'll be covering. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I was excited about just enjoying the other speakers. Um, very, very excited. I'd like to thank the organizers and uh, really thank the panelists. Sitting back and just listening to you has um, um, made me enjoy just being part of uh, Inspire Africa. 
I love um, what the president Paul started off with talking about um, the vision for this year. And one of the things that, that resonated with me was Africans stop looking back at our past. There's an African adage that says that uh, if you look to the past, it's difficult for you to look forward or move forward at the same time. Yeah, we can learn from the past. Um, I like the fact that the Asians, and I think our Ugandan brothers would accept that the Asians that were sent out of Uganda in the 70s came to the UK, and despite the past, they've actually flourished. Uh, we have their, their, uh, their children sitting at the highest level in parliament in the UK. Um, we look at um, the aspect of the Jews that uh, Germany um, almost obliterated. Um, and we realized that in less than 70 years, um, they, they own 40% uh, of the wealth in America. So I want to obviously begin to, um, on my day, I'll be talking on, uh, um, on creating an executive strategy for Africa. From my perspective, um, I will literally be borrowing from everything that the pa other panelists will be sharing. Um, it's the fact that I, I need to put together a blueprint. The blueprint will, will, will take from three parts. Um, those three parts I will leave till that day. Um, and literally it's creating a blueprint, I call it Africa 2050. I like what the last um, panelist just talked about. The fact that um, even though the world has been carved uh, and Africa has been seen as the food basket of the world, I dare to say because of our advantage, and that's one of the blocks I'm going to be talking about, because of our advantage of our median age being very low, we are able to leapfrog, we are able to change our own story. We're not necessarily just going to be producing food for the rest of the world to add value to. I believe very strongly that we are in a position to do that ourselves. So I introduce myself, I'm Reverend Anthony Ashai, a pastor, um, and also a pastor for 24 years and a real estate practitioner for 30 years. I'm also the CEO of Soar Rising, uh, a real estate development solution for Africa. Um, the intention is to, is to ultimately build cities um, that will be hubs, as it were, to, to bring about the change that I believe Africa is ready to, to accomplish. There have been a lot of talk about Africa is your time. That's because Africa needs to understand that it is not a short-term thing. I believe that Africa is our season. Um, I believe whatever God wants to do with Africa starts right about now, and it will start unfolding over the next 20, 30 years. 2030 to 2050 are very, are very pivotal years. I'll be talking a lot about that. Um, some of the things that I want delegates to walk away with is not to blame or put the ownership on anybody else. Uh, I will be talking about practical things that delegates can do. There's a saying of, that I love, if it's to be, it's up to me. I, I want the delegates to be able to walk away, knowing on, that if they invest their time and resources in the things we're gonna be talking about, we can transform Africa. There'll be personal growth, community growth, both economically and uh, family-wise, and we'll see Africa move forward. Um, I'm also gonna be talking a bit about what uh, the president spoke about, how diaspora, in, in biblical times, there is no time that God wants to do something that emancipates a people, that diaspora is not involved. Joseph was in diaspora. Uh, Moses, to an extent, was in diaspora. They, uh, Daniel was in diaspora. There is always, always the need for diaspora. Um, and I believe very strongly that a lot of the resources that Africa needs for her renaissance and the transformation will come from the continent, but also diaspora. We'll be talking a lot about that. And it's not a charitable mindset. Africa would be the place to invest, not pure, not based on charity. It will have one of the highest growth rates and return rates for, for, the, for the world. And so in diaspora, we would have access. I'll be talking about the kind of platforms that we need to create to make funding for African projects a lot easier. We'll be focusing on that. That will be within the strategy. But when we are done, I'm hoping that by the time I close, um, all the delegates will be able to walk away with something that is a, a form of blueprint. One of the things that excites me, and it excites me, and I'm not going to um, hide this, is that Africa has the potential to surpass India and China in terms of being the potential development zone. You know, um, the growth rate of Africa 
in terms of um, GDP and in terms of the ability to leapfrog, and I like what was said before, um, will be seen in Africa. Um, and they are not things that we, we will talk about, they are practical things um, that we will walk away with, that you can do. And uh, collectively, if we do, we'll begin to see the change. But ultimately, I'm hoping to create a kind of uh, working document, uh, something that you can take away. I'll be using a lot of slides, but hopefully uh, we'll have a 30-year journey that you can start tomorrow or at the end of the conference and over the next 30 years. Personally, you will see a growth in your wealth, a growth in your, in your family, in terms of who they become one of the mountains is family, but also a continent collectively growing together. I'm very excited. Um, it's such a privilege to be part of Synergy Africa again, Inspire Africa. And um, I'm looking forward to the conference. God bless you. Thank you, Anthony. We look forward to that blueprint um, uh, for us. We'll go to uh, Dr. Peter Simwe. Uh, greetings. We have a lot of rain here. I went off actually for some time because of too much rain. My internet was unstable. As you've heard, I'm Peter Asimwe. My training is in the industrial chemistry. I was trained to make perfume. I was trained to make sugar, to make shop. I was trained to add value to the resources we have in Africa. Sadly, when I finished university, I could not add value to the things that were here that I could see, I couldn't because of the leadership at that time, because of the philosophies at that time. It's when I realized actually the problem of Africa is not resources. Africa's problem is leadership. So I began to study the leadership that would transform Africa. I began, I did a research on how transformation comes about. And I want to share some of those things when that time comes on how we can bring transformation the mind shift, the head shift, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and the heart shift, and of course, the, the, the hand shift. So I want to deal with those things, how you can bring change, how you can change people's thinking to turn resources into opportunities. My topic is going to be harnessing. Africa's resources and opportunities. That's what I'm going to be focusing on. And uh, if you have read the Joseph generation, I'm going to draw a lot of principles from there because I use Joseph as an example. A man who came to Africa and was able to harness Africa's resources to cause it to become a superpower. We want to draw some principles there. And then I will share with you some success stories. God bless you. Thank you so much, um, Peter. We look forward to uh, your session and you'll be sharing that session with uh, David Sepria. David, if you can uh, quickly introduce uh, yourself. Okay, thank you very much, Emmanuel. Uh, my name is David Sepuya. Um, my basic background is in journalism. Um, I've been a journalist for most of my working life. I headed, um, I've headed the newspapers, the big newspapers in Uganda. And um, since then, I've done quite a bit of consultancy, particularly with the World Bank. And um, I've also written a, a couple of, a few books, a number of books anyway. But uh, principally in this is that I'm going to examine um, the contradiction between Africa's riches and Africa's lack of wealth. And I'll emphasize lack of wealth, which is really poverty. But the gist of it is 
the lack of wealth. How come we have a big disparity between our resources that I, I, I name, I, I, I term as natural capital and uh, our well-being, our wealth, how come? It is all about the harnessing of these resources. I'll be examining how we can turn natural capital into productive capital, which is the source of the wealth of nations. That's the history of the world. It's been like that. And uh, I believe it will be no different for Africa. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for being brief. Um, I left out Dr. Msinguzi, apologies, doctor. Uh, I'll just give you a chance. You'll be also talking about investment in health. Um, last but not least, uh, just welcome Dr. Geoffrey Msinguzi. Well, thank you so much, Emmanuel. I'm um, wondering why my video can't turn on. Uh, I don't know. You had some bit of control on your side. Are you able to turn it on? You kind of switched it off. Um, yes, excellent. Hope you're able to see me. Um, I'm Dr. Jokram Singzi. I'm a public health specialist. I work with the School of Public Health. Makara University in the Department of Disease Control and Environmental Health. I also partly work with the University of Antwerp and the Department of Primary Health Care and Interdisciplinary Health. Um, I, I was asked and requested to talk about investment in health, our greatest health. Um, I have to say to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this. This is really my first time. Uh, I also have to say that uh, there is no time uh, as this when COVID-19 struck the world that has shown, shown a lot of uh, disparities and differences across regions of the world, across countries. Uh, it's unbelievable that up to this time, Africa is still struggling to get doses of vaccines uh, uh, for the population. And of course, this has also presented a lot of opportunity. And actually, I think this conference comes in very timely. Africa, we need to wake up. Africa, we need to get ready. Africa, we need to invest in our health. Uh, in the, this particular conference, I'll actually talk about how we actually investing in health. What do the indicators show? I'll particularly focus on cardiovascular disease indicators. That's where I do a lot of work uh, across um, several countries here in Uganda, where I'm a principal investigator on a specific project called Named Spices, which is scaling up packages of interventions for cardiovascular disease prevention in sub Saharan Africa and in Europe. Uh, this project particularly invests or uh, invests a lot of time and effort in cardiovascular health uh, in six uh, universities across five uh, countries in Uganda that is in do our work in Mekong and Rikwe. So I'll draw a lot of examples of what we are doing in that place. We are doing a cascade of uh, cardiovascular health uh, prevention uh, from the community to the healthcare facilities, equipping and trying to support them to be able to actually uh, help the population to screen and identify and of course, um, equip them with basic knowledge, equip them with basics that they need to be able to uh, deal with their uh, CVD risk factors. We are also in South Africa, in Limpopo, the far north uh, region of South Africa, which is fairly deprived compared to uh, within the South African context. And then also we are in the UK, in two sites in Nottingham, and we are also in, in Sussex. We are also in France in another deprived area called Brest, and then um, uh, in, the, in Antwerp, it's in deprived areas where we have a lot of particularly African population. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, in, in, the, in the presentation I'll be making, I'll focus on the, on the illness world of continuum. I look, I'll present that continuum and see how are we investing 
our our indicators are they moving towards the illness side or our indicators moving towards the wellness side from there we shall really be able to see whether we are doing the right thing and then of course I'll move on to do some bit of proposal in terms of what can we do differently? Can we invest a lot of information? What are the tools that are available with us that we can actually put in a lot of our resources? Of course, I also move on to dissect it across uh, different sectors, within the community, uh, the family, the individual level, then of course at the national level, and of course also bringing other players, global players in this whole investment of health. So I think we shall really have to discuss more during the, uh, during the panel on, on Thursday. And I look forward to interacting with more of you. And then, of course, discussing issues that are important to Africa. COVID-19 is a good example for us. And we need to use this as an opportunity to harness our resources, to harness our efforts, to harness our abilities to be able to invest in health. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you so much. And last but not really the least, uh, we really appreciate and we're looking forward to the work that you're doing in the continent um, and uh, really connecting with you on Thursday uh, when you talk about investment in health. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've um, had a long um, evening, but before I let you go, I'll just, I'm just going to ask um, the moderators if they are, uh, want to just activate their videos, if you can. Um, Otherwise, I just want to thank our speakers for um, giving us the time and, and giving the, the audience just a, a glimpse of what is to come. Uh, I think it was necessary. I know we did kind of what is done in the university. Before you do your research, you have to defend the topic and then you, you come and actually uh, defend the research itself. Uh, but thank you very much. We really appreciate you for all um, your time. I think it was great to really connect with our speakers. These are carefully selected um, uh, speakers um, and we are so glad that uh, you'll be the ones uh, to really address the conference. It's a power packed week, uh, a lot to learn uh, from across the spectrum of life. Um, and we're looking forward to really taking in as much as we can uh, during this uh, this week, we are open to learning. Uh, I believe that uh, God is going to use this time to kind of launch us. In our coming up with the theme of get ready, we just sense that it's um, kind of like getting ready to run. Uh, just saying, get ready, set, and go. We believe that by the end of uh, the week, we'll be ready to go and transform our continent of Africa. And we really look forward to uh, our speakers addressing us in detail. We'll give you adequate time. There are lots of questions that have come through the chat. Thank you for the speakers again for responding to some of those questions. We appreciate you for that. But um, we'll definitely take those questions into the conference uh, to make sure that they are addressed uh, during the conference. It's been a wonderful uh, evening or afternoon. I see the team. Can you just uh, activate your videos? My um, uh, my director, if you can activate the videos of the, um, the speakers, all the video, all the speakers, and then we can take a quick picture. It's a pity we are not together. It would have been nice to, to take this um, uh, together in a... Um, uh, but we'll, we'll try and see what we can do uh, in terms of just taking a, a, a so that's right. okay, Thank you, Dr. James, for uh, braving the traffic and being with us. We really appreciate you for that. Uh, all you. right. Um, we'll just see if we can take some quick uh, picture. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'll just ask the... Um, I, I now ask the moderators. I see Ben Mwine is on the call. The guys will be, I just want the speakers to see you so that they can connect with you. Uh, ben, if you can activate your, your video, please, um, all the guys quickly before Lillian. Um, just want to see you guys activate your video. Lillian, are you able to do that, guys?
or you're struggling? Um, I'm personally not able to. I'm driving. Very, I'm not able to. Very dark. All right. My All right. Own. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll do it um, during the week. <laughs> Uh, let me just appreciate all the uh, the panelists and the speakers one more time. And thank you for all those who have joined us across the world through um, uh, Facebook and through this channel. We really look forward to um, having a power packed week. Do not miss. I encourage you to share um, with, your, um, with your colleagues, your friends, this is something not to be missed. Um, you could pay a lot to actually be able to extract this. It's completely free of charge. Um, and yeah, we're grateful for, uh, for, for, for our ability to just bring this caliber of speakers. And most of these guys are coming to us absolutely um, uh, without us having to pay them. If we had to pay them, it would, would not be able to pay them. Uh, but we thank God for their willingness we share a common objective, which is to transform Africa. All the speakers, if you listen to them, their desire is to transform Africa. And that is our hope. And that is all we, we strive for as Inspire. We thank you once again. I'll leave it there and look forward to having you tomorrow for a power pack day. Thank you very much and God bless you. I'll ask um, uh, Dr. James, if you don't mind, just to pray for us and then we can leave. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to meet together and uh, just have a sense of what is on our hearts and also of what is coming. The next uh, week, we dedicate to you all the speakers and pray that um, even from the interaction tonight that you'll further refine the words on their hearts. We pray that you'll put your words in each speaker's mouth Lord, that uh, through those words, we shall be able to lay the foundations of Africa. Lord, we shall be able to open the heavens. We pray that you'll also uh, draw everyone who's supposed to be here. Thank you for the opportunity of being on a virtual platform where we can speak to people all across the continent, all across the world. We now pray that you will draw people in. We pray, Lord, that we'll have good connectivity. And we ask that you will anoint the airwaves. Lord, that you who has who designed this continent, <clears throat> you who saw us before the foundation of the earth, and you who has purposed uh, that certain things must happen in this generation, may this become a platform for you to download and to bring down the thoughts on your heart and inspire uh, people all across the continent. Lord, we pray that at the end of this day, this week, we shall see the vision. It will be very plain and we'll be able to run. We thank you, Lord. We pray that your blessing will be upon all the organizers. May your name be glorified this week. May this uh, conference play a key part in the advancement of your kingdom on the continent of Africa. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Uh, God bless you. See you tomorrow. Thank you very, very much. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you.